Hello and welcome to Counterpunch Radio. My name is Eric Dreitzer. Thanks so much for tuning in, coming back to the show. First time listeners finding the show, welcome aboard. Always happy to have you. Hope you've had a chance to check out Counterpunch Plus. I've been plugging it for months and months, but that is our subscriber section. It's our own little in-house Patreon type thing. We depend on everybody for your support. We depend on you guys to keep the lights on, to keep Counterpunch going, and Counterpunch Plus is the way to do that. We had a print magazine for ever so many years, but that is just not the way that the media goes anymore. And so we do now have the subscription section on the website. Lots of great content in there. Of course, Jeff Sinclair's columns and all of the great contributors, regular contributors to Counterpunch are all there, plus all of our uh, contributors from all over the world who uh, provide all kinds of interesting analysis and perspectives on a wide variety of issues. Really, stuff you're not going to find anywhere else you appreciate that go to counterpunch get yourself a subscription please do say that eric sent you or don't because no one will ask you that question um okay i want to turn to my guest today very happy to speak with scott park and scott is also a counterpunch plus contributor can you believe it what are the odds scott is on twitter at spark I 1969. He is the co-host of the Green and Red podcast. He is a climate organizer with Rising Tide North America. He's a great guy doing great work. Hi, Scott. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming on for all of the great work that you've done. And I really do want to jump right into that because on the one hand, climate activism and, and these sorts of issues seems so all-encompassing, seems like something that is just impossible to enter into. And yet, when we hear from people who are dedicating themselves to this work, it often provides us an entry point. So Scott, give us a little bit of an entry point, your journey as an activist that brought you into this fight. Yeah, I, I'll start off by saying that I had been involved in various issues when I was in college, and this is like late 80s, early 90s. And so it's when we had a, a pretty fierce for, forest defense movement on the West Coast. I was living on the East Coast, but I was going to, <clears throat> I was going to college in uh, rural North Carolina and uh, got involved with my friends there and started doing stuff, kind of faded, faded, faded out of it a little bit once I finished college. But then uh, in the late 90s, about 10 years later, when we, uh, when we kind of went into this period post Seattle after the World Trade Organization protests in Seattle, is I, I got re-engaged and have uh, never really stopped. I, I always say that I, I went to this really awesome organizing school, which was called the Anti-Corporate Globalization Movement. And so from there, I got involved in, you know, we did a lot of global justice work. I also did a lot of anti-war work. I, you know, organized in my spare time a, a grassroots campaign against Halliburton around the war in Iraq. And then uh, later on moved into working with environmental groups and working on climate. And so I've Worked at I've worked at both Rain, I've worked at Rainforest Action Network as a climate campaigner and worked with Rising Tide North America and working on climate justice issues both for like you know going on two decades. It's fascinating too to point out the fact that anti-war activism and climate change activism are interrelated, and one of those issues that people often leave out of the climate conversation is the fact that uh, global imperialism, the U.S. military, is one of the primary drivers of climate change. Yeah, I believe the Pentagon actually has the largest footprint of any institution in the world. Largest carbon footprint, excuse me. Yeah, and I don't know that that even counts all of the blood that they shed for the oil. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. Let's let's talk a little bit about the specifics here, Scott. Um, tell me a little bit about the fight against Keystone XL, KXL. Um, this is something that for those of us who have been in the sort of counterpunch milieu, we've been following for years and years now. But it's good now that we have kind of reached this culmination, this moment of culmination, that we look back a little bit how this fight began, what what it was about, and what this ultimate victory tells us about the future. Yeah, um, on on Keystone Excel, and and I'll just I'll just throw this out too, as I've written a couple of different pieces over the years for Counterpunch on the fight against Keystone Excel. If folks also want to kind, if folks want to check those out, but the the Keystone fight basically, you know, it's they the Keystone pipeline was intended to uh, take tar sands oil from Alberta and bring it down through the middle of the U.S. to the Gulf Coast, where it would hit the refinery complexes on the Gulf Coast, most notably around Houston. The, um, the Alberta tar sands is a is a uh, uh, 
it's a it's a dirty thick sort of tar sands it's actually mixed up with a lot of sand it's there's a lot of bitumen it's actually um it's much dirtier than like regular oil and definitely oil that you get from uh places in the middle east for example uh and so for there's there's some crazy numbers like for every barrel of tar sands oil that's ref, that's refined and clean you spend like you know two barrels of natural gas doing the actual cleaning process you spend four got you, you spend four barrels of water basically also as part of that process with the steaming etc uh and so it's and a lot of the extraction going on in alberta is also in like first nations territory and so it's it's you know it's it's having a, a environmental pollution impact on the local communities up there so we have dirty water we have dirty air as a result of that and then we also have a um uh, you know, a social impact of oil workers being near and dear to those to those communities, which I think we're going to talk a little bit later. Uh, that pipeline was uh, going to run from Alberta to the Gulf Coast, and in the early uh, it, in the First Nations people have been campaigning against it since 2006 or 2007, as far back as I as I know. And then in 2011, the, the environmental community in the U.S decided to kind of go all in on that campaign as well. And there was a, a, a large two week long civil disobedience action at the White House called the Tar Sands Action where so over 2000 people actually risked arrest. I was one of those people to basically kind of put this on the radar of the Obama administration. It's like, you know, this is the late summer of 2011. This is before Occupy starts, but this is also when the climate movement is starting to sort of bubble up. And so a lot of people went to that. They heard the call. Uh, many of them were elders. And so they heard the calls of their grandchildren to go and like take action against this pipeline. And so the, the, the U S environmental community embraced this, but this was very much like indigenous led both indigenous communities in the U S because it would be flowing down through, you know, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, uh, you know, Kansas, Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma and, and Texas. And so it was crossing a lot of indigenous territories. Well, Montana actually was another part of it. And so uh, very much led by like the indigenous communities in the U.S. and First Nations communities in Canada. And then the, the sort of like mainstream environmental movement also embraced it. And it led to like this big pressure campaign, which lasted for many years against the Obama administration. And then we also saw subsequent sort of like spinoff campaigns, I guess you could say. And so like there's where, you know, certain organizations went after banks, which were funding TransCanada, which was the company. Uh, you also saw a pretty brutal backcountry fight in East Texas because there was another leg that ran from uh, Oklahoma down to the Gulf Coast. It was called Keystone KXL South. And a lot of uh, environmentalists actually partnered in a coalition with like Texas landowners. And like these are not this isn't Berkeley or Boulder we're talking about. This is like you know, rural East Texas, and it's a very conservative place, but they didn't actually want the pipeline running through and poison their water, poison their air, et cetera. And so there was about a year long campaign, a direct action campaign where they disrupted construction on Keystone, Keystone South, running from Oklahoma down to um, the Valero refinery in, in, um, in, in out near Houston, in Houston. Um, and then while that was happening, a lot of the mainstream environmental organizations actually were like, that's not a winning battle. So we're going to focus on the other part, which is you know, you know, highly problematic. Um, and uh, there was and so there was a big fight around what was called Keystone North. And, you know, it was, you know, went after, like I said, it went after Obama, it went after Wall Street, it went after Hillary Clinton. Um, in 2015, it, the pressure paid off. And so Obama uh, rejected the permit because the fight was over the permit being approved by the State Department, which was crossing the Canadian U.S. border, uh, which is the reason they were able to build Keystone South because it crossed no borders. The Obama administration actually did a rubber stamp and approved that just to put that out there for our climate hero president of the of the last decade. Um, and then, and then, so in 2015, he rejected it. Uh, you know, for whatever reasons that we could talk, we could talk about. We could probably go off on a tangent about that. Um, and then the following November, uh, Donald Trump was elected, and one of his first acts in office was to go back and approve the permit. And the, during that period, a lot of organizations, you know, environmental organizations, indigenous-led organizations actually fought it in court and just kept appealing it and appealing it and, you know, taking it to, like, various channels of government, all the while while 
we were preparing for a sort of like direct action campaign against against the pipeline. But then Trump lost. Um, they never got Keystone off the ground uh, because there were so many legal challenges and for lots of other reasons. Biden comes back in, <laughs> takes the Trump's approval of the permit back, and then uh, I believe it was last month, end of June, early July. Oh, excuse me, it was the beginning of June. Um, Trans Canada, which has also changed its name to uh, TC Energy, which I always feel like it's a it's a, a victory uh, that we have like so toxified a corporate brand that they changed their name. Uh, but TC Energy basically said that they no longer saw the project as viable and they canceled it. So it wasn't just like it was going to be a ping pong back and forth between Democratic and Republican administrations, but the, the company has now canceled it. Now, who knows whether it'll come back, but it seems like they've kind of given up at this point. That was a long winded. No, that's good. That's okay. what we're looking okay. for. No, no, no. That's exactly what we're looking for. But I want to get into a little bit more okay. about how this happened and specifically in, in um, something that you've written about how the struggle against uh KXL was in many ways really this collective struggle. You even wrote about some of the indigenous elders who spoke about this when, you know, sort of uh, speaking about the victory over this pipeline and speaking about how this really was a collective effort. You already mentioned a little bit about, you know, the sort of uh, disparate forces from indigenous elders to East Texas landowners, but talk a little bit about some of the other constituencies that got involved in this struggle and some of the other groups, organizations, or anything else of note. Yeah. I, I, I would say that the the radical environmental community also embraced this. You know, in the in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties, we saw this radical forest movement which fought logging, old growth logging, you know, this is the Earth First, Judy Berry sort of scene, uh, very much uh, uh, the the um, the descendants of that movement took up fighting pipelines in the late 2000s into the into the 20 aughts or whatever it is we call it. And so like the fight in East Texas, for example, was like both conservative landowners as well as like this more radical environmental element. And so we saw like there was like an 80 something day tree set blocking the blocking the Keystone pipeline. Uh, there was this sort of wave of just constant disruption with the goal of uh, slowing down, slowing it down, costing them as much money as possible. Uh, and the way and, and the disruption was daily, every other day, sometimes weekly, people would go and chain themselves to equipment. It would be half a day of lost work for the company. It would sometimes be a full day of lost work. And so it was just like this sort of constant pounding. And then also like outside of, you know, that frontline area, we also saw um, a lot of people taking action activity at federal buildings to kind of put the Obama administration on notice. We saw a lot of people taking action at the banks, which were the big funders. And so like these like sort of frontline direct action pressure on like you know, federal politicians, and then definitely pressure on the corporate sector, particularly Wall Street, have all been like sort of kind of key ingredients to these pipeline fights. And so, and we can say that about Keystone, we can say that about Dakota Access Pipeline, we can say that about the current fight against Line 3, we can say that against about the fight around the Mountain Valley Pipeline going on right now in Appalachia. And so it's, it's, it's a really kind of important piece to say that this sort of like, we're, we're shifting paradigms here, we're making flashpoints, we're it's a it, in, in some ways it's like very much like the kind of Martin Luther King sort of strategy in the civil rights movement where you know we want to do direct action and we want people to uh, we want to gain notice of middle America who are going to put pressure on you know and, and I actually don't think this stuff really works when it comes to Republican administrations but like we are going to put pressure on Democratic politicians whether it's federal or state level and just like really hold their feet to the fire with this. Very, and it's very similar strategy to what King did around, you know, uh, around civil rights, voting rights, that sort of thing. There's much more to say about all of that, but since you already mentioned it, why don't you just take us in to a, a little conversation, a little background about Line 3. What is Line 3? Where does it fit into the broader, uh, you know, uh, geographical map of these pipelines and so forth? And why is this now the front line of the struggle? Yeah, I, there were... There are a number of, of tar sands pipelines. There, there are actually five pipelines, I believe, that cross the U.S.-Canadian border from Alberta 
not, I can't actually name all of them, but Keystone's one of them. And then the Enbridge pipeline is another. And so Enbridge has multiple lines. And so there's a line three and there's a line five. Uh, line five is actually being fought in Michigan right now, not with necessarily direct action, but the governor has actually ordered Enbridge to stop construction on line five. Line three, so Michigan's Democratic Governor uh, Gretchen Whitmer in Minnesota, Democrat Governor Tim Waltz has actually approved all of the permits. And line three is a pipeline. It runs probably three or 400 miles. It runs from Alberta uh, down through Minnesota to Wisconsin uh, to, you know, endpoints on the Great Lakes. Uh, has, the, has the carbon footprint of about 50 coal-fired power plants. It crosses, uh, it crosses like indigenous territory, violated actually a number of treaties which were signed by the U.S. government and indigenous nations. Um, but line three, you know, Enbridge, like TransCanada is a pretty nasty Canadian oil company. Um, and so that is like what has heated up since December, it's December or late November is when Waltz actually signed the permits. And so we've seen this waves of unrelenting action uh, to date. Over 500 people have been arrested. They, you know, people got arrested yesterday fighting line three. It's a, it's a daily occurrence at this point. And it's not just like people doing a sit in at a congressional office or people doing a protest outside of the bank. People are walking onto, uh, you know, construction sites where there's active construction going on, where they're actively putting pipe in, where they're actively drilling under the Mississippi River, because it crosses the Mississippi in at least three or four points. Um, and people are like locking themselves to that equipment. There's been at least two lock-ons to drills drilling under the Mississippi. Um, this is indigenous led, it's indigenous women led people like Winona LaDuke and Tara Hoska, um, are these like, you know, are these, are, are these figures who are leading this struggle and it's, it's, it's really, it's, um, what I'll say is it has become like a, um, it's a militarized hot zone there. And so to be up there, I was just up there last week and to be there, it's like, you're under constant scrutiny and constant surveillance of the police. Enbridge has actually created a slush fund, which was reported on in The Intercept, to basically put lots of money for equipment into these police into these police forces. They've created an interagency task force, which is local, county, state, federal, and Enbridge. And so they said it's to buy them, you know, PPE equipment, for example, but it's actually really to buy like riot gear or pay them for overtime, things like that. And so it's like, Line three has become a hot zone. It's very militarized. Last week, the, the police tried to barricade in one of the camps, let no vehicles in and out on the day that they started drilling under the Mississippi. Um, and so it has, um, it's, it's gotten really ugly, I, I would say. They, they, the most recent you know round of charges, they actually charged something like 24, 26 people with felonies, like a kind of made up, uh, made up felony of saying that's theft to occupy a piece of equipment because you're robbing the owner of his, you know, ability to make a living, that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, this is also very much the radical environmental kind of direct action community, which is part of this. This is also very much, you know, indigenous community from, you know, all over the country, but definitely from people from territories in Northern Minnesota, so-called Minnesota. Since you've mentioned it, uh, before we head to the break, I want to touch a little bit on the role of women and indigenous women here, both. Uh, I suppose we could probably come back to it in talking about the role that they play in in mounting this resistance and in being leaders of this movement. But I would like to also touch on something that you've written, or at least touched on in some of your writing for Counterpunch, namely this correlation between oil projects and pipeline projects and sexual violence and violence against women, especially violence against indigenous women. Um, can you talk a little bit about that correlation, why that happens, how that happens, how it's been seen, and uh, why we need to be talking more about it? Right. So when you have these big fossil fuel infrastructure projects, you have a phenomenon known that they call the, the man camp. And so, uh, for example, like there's a lot of ga oil and gas operations in the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota. And so when we see the emergence of these man camps, which is like, you know, sometimes it's just a hotel that a company rents out for like it's 50 workers, is that we see an uh, uh, increase in sexual violence against women, indigenous women, girls and, and relatives. Uh, and uh, there's a stat that has led to a 22% national increase of, of violence against indigenous women. 
Um, there's actually a, a great piece in uh, Truth Out by uh, Candace Burnt, which actually talks about this quite a bit, but we have this huge shock, shocking trend of sexual violence connected to Line 3. Within the last two weeks when I was up there, they, uh, the, the authorities had actually busted a sex ring of Enbridge oil workers um, who were like trafficking in women and girls. And so it's, it's, you know, line, you know, line three pipeline is, is a, is a, uh, it's violence in action. And so it's violence against the climate. It's violence against ecosystems. It's violence against protesters who are protesting it, but it's also violence against women, particularly indigenous women who are like in close proximity of, of the construction of the pipeline. And just the last thing before we go to the break, you already mentioned the governor in Minnesota, but I think it's an it's a point worth illustrating that you have here a Democrat who's not your friend, right? Just to re, just to reiterate the point yet again that even when a Democratic president or a Democratic governor or what have you may take the right decision, one can't extrapolate from that that these people are anything close to allies. No, and I I think we've been you know the. The moves of the the Biden administration, I, I think a, a certain level, there were things that Biden gave us when he came in around climate, like him canceling Keystone. That's that's a that's a good thing, right? That permit, but but like the, you know the Democrats aren't much different than the Republicans. You know the, the the oil lobby basically goes out after them as aggressively as they do. I guess they don't have to go as aggressively after the after the Republicans, but because it's it's pretty uh it's a pretty open relationship there, but. You know, they, they go they're aggressively lobby the, the Democrats put money in into their, you know, campaign coffers. Uh, there was a recent expose of Exxon lobbyists who were like caught in a in a sort of a gotcha moment bragging about how they what their game plan is to get move Democratic senators on various like oil and climate action. Um, but like Tim Waltz, who, you know, nationally has tried to create this profile of a BNA a, a, a liberal Democrat is like, he's like signed off on all this, all these pipeline permits. He has his, his Lieutenant governor, Peggy Flanagan also supports it. Keith Ellison, who they thought was a progressive champion, you know, has moved more slowly on some of um, slowly on some of the uh, uh, things around the pipeline three pipeline as well. I mean, the, the thing about it is that the, you know, the Democrats are very much the, the party of the, of, of the, of the ruling class as much as the Republicans. Well, you get no argument from us on counter uh, from counterpunch on that one. So yeah, I think that's why right. you guys are the only ones that, that publish me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're happy to do so. So let's take a quick break. On the other side of the break, I want to talk a little bit more about direct action because, as we all know, direct action gets the goods, and it has gotten the goods yet again. Let's talk more about that with Scott Parkin here on Counterpunch Radio. We'll be right back. And we're back chatting with Scott Parkin here on Counterpunch Radio on Twitter at Spark. I-1969, uh, the podcast, the green and red podcast, do make that part of your normal listening rotation just next to Counterpunch Radio, of course. Now, Scott, um, I want to ask you a little bit about direct action because it I want to leave some of the tactics and things uh, for a little bit later, and I want to talk about how the movement you yourself, of course, but the movement broadly, how it's targeted. What are some of the ways in which state repression, uh, at which is in turn corporate repression, how has that been brought to bear against activists who are fighting this fight? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most blatant example right now, I mean, there's a lot of blatant examples, but one is that we have 30 plus state legislatures which have passed anti-protest and anti-pipeline protest bills uh, at least one has actually passed a bill. I think it's Oklahoma, which actually makes it legal for a driver to run over protests, blocking a road and kill them and there be no repercussions. So they basically legalize murder of protests. Uh, that's in a number of the other bills too. I believe Oklahoma at last I heard was the only one that where they had legalized it. Um, so that's, that's one glaring example. Uh, you know, what I was kind of talking about before the break is that we've seen corporations have both put a lot of money into local law enforcement to surveil and repress, suppress uh, protest groups, camps, individuals, 
And then what we saw more like uh, in like Standing Rock, but we see this, you know, across the boards, they also hire uh, private security, which are staffed by ex-law enforcement, ex-military who run quote unquote counterinsurgency programs. That's definitely what they did at, at, um, at Standing Rock. The company, the private security company was called Tiger Swan. The, the pipeline company was called ETP or Energy Transfer Pipeline, uh, Energy Transfer Partners. Um, and then the other one I want to say, which is also the one with the, they're looking with the effect of, of quieting protests is actually civil litigation uh, or slap suits, strategic lawsuits against public participation, which is, you know, we've been seeing since the anti-nuclear movement of the 70s and 80s. And so definitely individuals, but also organizations like big name branded or environmental organizations, which have been part of like the resistance in whatever capacity they play, have been like in many ways silenced by fear of slap suits. ETP did a, a billion dollar slap suit, which named Greenpeace and a number of other organizations as uh, as defendants that were costing them lots of money. Uh, and so they've used slap suits to, um, to, to silence dissent as well, um, or at least attempt to. I mean, I don't wanna comment on whether it's working or not, because I, I do still see a lot of groups doing a lot of stuff, but it's like, Kind of like it's a it's a very scary thing between especially the anti pipeline legislation anti protest legislation and then also the 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 uh, slap suits plus and then the state <laughs> police the police state and of course I I don't know if it's uh, implied in your statement there but uh, uh, active surveillance infiltration real real world infiltration not just online infiltration that's something that we have seen in in other recent uh, uh, pipeline protest examples yeah and that kind of comes with what I was talking about the police state and then the private security like Tiger Swan actually put uh, infiltrators into groups in the in the in the fighter on the Dakota Access Pipeline. I'm sure that there'll be some point in the near future in the near near future where we'll learn about that with Line Three as well. Um, I mean, it, it's actually to me, it's you know, it's very courageous and bold the way in which people in the face of this repression. It was like it's scary to be in Minnesota in in some of those towns up there if you're if you're against the pipeline. And the, and the courage and the boldness that they continue to show every day and with the knowledge that they're probably infiltrated, that they're being watched, helicopters buzz the camps, you know, Department of Homeland Security, Border Patrol helicopters buzz the camps. And so like, it's a, it's a you know, pe more people should go there because the more people we have there, the less likely it is they're going to succeed. And, but, but like that sort of like surveillance infiltration is like, just like part of the, it's part of those police states playbook as far as we're concerned going back red scare days the first red scare absolutely and i guess that's one of the reasons why i brought it up is just to kind of illustrate the fact that all of the things that we might read about in history books or you know from from a hundred years ago or from the time of cointel pro or whatever all of those same tactics are being deployed just now today yesterday tomorrow against all of the people that are engaged in these frontline struggles like this right exactly i mean it's a it's a long history they have a playbook which they think is effective and they continue to use it from from the red scare against the wobblies and the and the anarchists to to COINTELPRO to uh, green, the Green Scare, even in the last 20 years. Yeah, and, and that's not even to talk about the fact that they now use the so-called counterinsurgency tactics, uh, so-called war on terror tactics, the war on terror having been brought home, as it were, thanks to, uh, you know, the, the, the ever the ever drifting movement to the right in this country. But that's a that's a much larger issue that we don't have time for right now. I want to ask you, Scott, um, I, I, I want to say one thing about that is that this sort of war on the left, this is a little bit of a tangent, this war on the left is like pretty much the playbook of the ruling class, like the, they use the liberals against the left and they use the far right against the left. Absolutely. And, and, and it's like, you know, it's why unions are in decline. It's why, you know, all these pipelines are being built. It's why environmental groups sell out. It's all kind of part of that same playbook. 100% correct. I agree entirely. Um, I want to ask you a little bit. I want to return to KXL for just a second, but specifically I want to ask you about how, if and how, the key, the fight against the Keystone XL pipeline really represents sort something of a framework uh, 
for struggle, for future struggles, because I know, and you've written some about this, that, you know, a lot of the ways in which that battle was fought and ultimately won have to now be transposed onto these other struggles and, and, and carried forward. So can you talk a little bit about that and how it happened and, and some of the things that uh, we want to take away from that? Yeah. I mean, I think in the, in the framework, I mean, there's a couple of different like frameworks, which were overlapping. And so we have an organizing framework where we've like told a compelling there, we told a compelling story and moved a lot of people to get involved. We took, we moved people from being like neutral or, you know, passively with us to being more actively with us. And so, you know, started off, uh, the most, you know, we saw thousands of people risk arrest at the white house. Then we started seeing people going and locking themselves at construction sites in East Texas. Uh, and so that sort of like organize that organizing framework is that like, we're, that we're, no one's going to do this but us. Obama, he he greenlit the 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 southern leg of the of Keystone, right? He's he's not going to do anything without our pressure. And so, like our organizing framework is basically how we build pressure, how we build power, and how we put that onto these politicians who are supposedly with us, but they're really not, right? You know, little I put that in brackets. Um, and so that's that's one important framework. I I feel like a, another is this sort of. Um, is this is a is a narrative framework where we're telling a compelling story, which is going against the uh, which is going against the the mainstream or what the politicians and the mainstream media is telling us is like you know we're mounting a resistance and we're able to kind of push into this narrative and tell a different story through our organizing through our action, and then and then I think the other piece is um, I, I think is the sort of strategic political framework where it's like. These are the buttons that we need to push. Like we can do all the actions we want against a, against a pipeline company, but that's why they exist. So we need to find out what the other political buttons are. We need to push whether it's Obama, whether it's banks, whether it's some you know arm, other regulatory arm, etc. And I think all those overlap to create a sort of perfect storm within the within the Keystone XL pipeline fight. I feel like that also happened with Dakota Access. They still built that pipeline, and and gas and oil is still flowing through that. But like we so with Dakota Access, I feel like more than anything else, we shifted, we, we took that, we we exponentially grew that framework that we had used on Keystone. Like 10,000 people occupied at Stan Rock, Standing Rock fighting that pipeline. It, and it has, that has terrified ruling class oil companies, politicians. They don't want another Standing Rock, which is why I think they're trying to actually clamp down so hard right now on line three. And so you know, we're, we're basically shifting the paradigm and we're, we're changing the story and we just need to kind of keep doing it. And now that we're starting to come out of the pandemic, I don't think we're totally out, but we're starting to come out of the pandemic and we're starting to see a lot more people take action is like, that's also like terrifying the powers that be. And so that's why I also feel like they've locked down Northern Minnesota or trying to, they're not really done it yet because we still are doing actions every day, but they're trying to. You mentioned Standing Rock. Standing Rock is a uh, is an entry point for a lot of people, especially young people who have just come into some, uh, the fight and some of these issues in the last few years. And I wanted to talk a little bit about young people with you here for a second, um, primarily because we've talked a, a, on this show about the centrality of young people in leadership roles vis-a-vis -vis Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, confronting police violence, white supremacy, all of the things that happened in the wake of the Floyd Rebellion and so forth, and youth leadership being such a central aspect of all of that. So I wanted to ask you about the role of young people in the fight against the pipelines, young indigenous folks especially. Uh, I know they really are playing such a key role. Yeah, I mean, I... Well, I, I think you would agree that we've, de we've definitely seen a shift in the two more recent generations, which are, are, you know, reaching adulthood, adulthood, both millennials and Gen Z or Zoomers. And, you know, I think part of it, it's, and it's also like a, it's like these sort of like multiple crises popping up on each other. It's, it's one's the climate crisis. One is one was the pandemic. Another is like this economic crisis that we've been experiencing since like 2008. And they feel like they are not going to have as the quality of life that maybe their parents or grandparents had. Um, I, the, I'm really terrible with the numbers, but we've like 
seen an increasing number of people in the country who say there's big problems with capitalism. Socialism is not as bad as like the boomer generation told us, right? We, we, and we saw big support in those younger groups around the Sanders campaign, for example, and whatever I can like complain about Sanders, but like, I think that the kind of organizing and narrative like framework around that is also the same thing that took us from Occupy to Ferguson to Standing Rock to a lot of stuff around Trump into like, and then the Floyd rebellion. And I think that that is youth who are leading that and it's youth who are really core to that. And it's actually a really, I mean, there's a lot of every George Floyd protest I went to in the last year, every line three protest I've gone to in the last year, two years, it's all multi-generational, but the, like the sort of vibrant energy on the street. And I'm, I consider myself a street organizer is being led by these like younger generations. And, and we're, we're seeing like, the, the reason they're passed, in my opinion, the reason they pass anti-pipeline protest bills, voting voting suppression bills in red states and things like that is that they know that and the writing's on the wall and they are screwed. As long as we're able to channel it and win. Who, but who knows? Because they have a lot of things at their disposal. And speaking of those in leadership in the resistance, I wanted to just ask you a little bit about indigenous leadership uh, in this movement, particularly in light of just how uh, ravaged these communities have been by COVID. Um, uh, so many, so many have, uh, you know, so, so much knowledge has been lost. So many lives have been sort of sacrificed for lack of care, neglect, lack of access, all, all of the reasons that we could, you know, probably don't have time to go into. But I just wanted to ask you a little bit about the indigenous uh, uh, leaders in this movement and how COVID has impacted indigenous participation and or just impacted this struggle more broadly. I mean, I, I can't speak to this like really directly and i don't want to pretend to know or, or be an expert i i will say that at least the pipeline fights i'm seeing happen in indigenous territory first nations ter territory on both sides of the border is like very much like a fierce there's a there's a fierce resistance there um and i you know these are communities which are impacted by like lack of health care they're impacted by poverty they're they're impacted by systemic racism, interpersonal racism, institutional racism. And, and, and I, I actually feel like that is, um, that is like, and it's some, it's some of that hardship and I don't know, is, is like a, is, 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 is somewhat of a powerful thing. And it's also like a no compromise, it leads to a sort of no compromise uh, attitude. And in your recent writings for us at Counterpunch, you described uh, some of the recent direct actions. And it's, it's actually amazing because it's so easy to get lost in the Twitter verse or whatever and completely miss just how many amazing things are happening. So tell us a little bit. I mean, you don't have to give us every example, but give us some of the examples of some of the recent direct actions that have uh, taken place, many of which seem seemingly have been led by indigenous women, as we were talking about earlier. Yeah. And some of the indigenous the, the, led by the indigenous women. And, and many others I'd named before. Um, yeah. And you're not hearing about this on left Twitter or left book. That's for sure. Um, uh, you know, the, I've been up there twice in the last month. And so I went up there for like a, a bigger gathering called the treaty people gathering where about 2000 people showed up. There were two mass actions. Um, one, which was a kind of more prayerful occupation of a Enbridge drill pad on the Mississippi. And it was, it ended up being an eight day occupation, uh, and until they were like removed, they, they moved, they were much more cooperative than we saw. We have seen in other places, but like 50 people were like cited, you know, by the, by the, by the sheriff there. And then the other happened on the same day was in Hubbard County, which is the, um, you know, there's a lot of ways I could describe the sheriff of Hubbard County, but he's like, you know, he's probably like more reminiscent, reminiscent of Bull Connor or, or Jim Clark from the civil rights days. And he's, he's pretty harsh on the protesters. He's the one who barricaded that camp last week. And, uh, you know, there was a probably two or 300, excuse me, there's probably a 500 person occupation of an Enbridge pump station, uh, which was being built in Hubbard County. About 200 people got arrested. And that was like people linked arms, staring down the police sort of thing. And eventually, you know, eventually they held the occupation for 30 hours. The police actually were like 
really unprepared, even though they've gotten all this money from Enbridge, even though they're like augmented by other counties and augmented by the state police, were like still really unprepared for that. And that's the kind of place where we saw like Extinction Rebellion took a boat in and like 10 people locked themselves to it and held it for 30 hours. Or we saw tripods, which is a device used to block roads and forest defense. And so, you know, those actions, those two actions very much, we, you know, through the channels and the circles in which I work in very much got the attention of the, they got the attention of the mainstream media. They're both New York times and Washington post article, which also then led to us knowing that we got the attention of the, the Biden administration as well. And then when I was up there last week, there was this barricade, which led into a confrontation between people in uh, Camp Namwag, which is like one of the, which is where some of the more dynamic actions are coming out of about a dozen people got arrested there. And then a couple of days later, there was a number, another action of, that included Rainforest Action Network, Earth First, the GNU Collective, where, where about 30 people got arrested uh, and shut down work on the construction site for about 10 hours. Um, and, you know, that's where the police have come back with these pretty harsh felony charges on probably, you know, four fifths of the people who were arrested. And just to follow up on that, I was, any- I was at I was at all three of those sites over the last month. So. Is there any, is there any, I mean, is there any indication on the legal side of this? I mean, that seems not just harsh, but that, that, that seems like prosecutorially potentially not possible. So I, I'm just wondering, are, are those charges still there or have they been reduced? Is there any news on any of that? I, I believe that's uh, still ongoing. I think it's just getting started. They, they, they ex- there's expectations that some of the, some of these court cases will last for a year or two. We've seen before where they've they've attempted to establish these precedents and uh, you know come come down as hard as possible to sort of crucify somebody and set the example. And sometimes they sometimes they are successful and sometimes they're not. I suppose sometimes it depends on the judge that hears the case. In in Idaho in the mid nineties, there was a pretty fierce forest defense campaign called Cove Mallard. And this Idaho legislature basically passed a law that made it a felony to be an earth firster in Idaho. Um, and, and it's like similar, similar playbook is like, let's give the hardest legal punitive charges that we can give and to discourage more people from coming. And, you know, that's what they're doing that. And they respond with a lot of state violence. Well, that leads me to, I guess, what would be my last question, although it's always, I think, the one that I the, the one that I want to hear about the most. And that is when I talk to a veteran activist, somebody who's been doing this for a long time, who's who really understands the, uh, you know, the, the reality of this work. I always want to ask the question of what you want to say or impart to young people who are listening who are watching, who are maybe motivated about uh, getting involved on these issues, but don't know where to, how to, uh, where to apply their energies, or even whether it's worth it, considering the monumental scale of all of this and how much easier it is to just be cynical and go somewhere in a dark corner and die. Yeah, and cry, cry and give up, right? Um, I, I, well, one I would say is that definitely based on what we saw with Keystone is that we can make a difference and we can actually stop these pipelines. It's never too late. And if, you know, maybe we won't win on, maybe we'll win on line three and maybe we won't, but there's going to be, you know, there's more fossil fuel infrastructure fights ahead. We have many more. We, I would tell people to, you know, get educated, get involved, go, even if you're going to a protest in your neighborhood in front of a bank that funds these pipelines, you know, that's a great place to get started. Um, there's a, uh, a, uh, the, there's a couple of websites if you're actually interested in going to Minnesota itself. I believe it's like stopline3.org. And then there's another one, which is Winona LaDuke on the earth, and it's called Welcome Water Protectors. Um, and so those are a couple Those are a couple places to get plugged in. Uh, I'm Rising Tide, the, one of the groups I work with. We have a, every other week, we have a, a virtual training for people to um, learn about nonviolent direct action and figure and find out how to go to Minnesota. If you want to check out rising tide, North Um, but like there's, there's plenty of hope out there. And I know that's a, I, th- I don't think that's a, a popular thing to say. And like, there's a lot of scary stuff going on right now. Like Gulf of Mexico is on fire, 110 degree temperatures and, in, in you know, the Pacific Northwest, but like 
we're, we still have a fighting chance. And if, and, and maybe I'm wrong and maybe we don't, then we should also just like make the people who are making a lot of money off this as miserable as possible. That's a, that's an alternative. You know, that's the, that's my dark side. Saying that. I like your dark side and the silver linings that your dark side. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, we'll, we will leave it there. Scott Park. And thank you so much for coming on counterpunch radio, the podcast green and red podcast. Do get it on whatever your podcast platform of choice is. Scott is on Twitter at spark E or spark I 1969 Scott Park. And thanks so much for coming on counterpunch and chatting with us. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Listeners, viewers, thank you as always for your continued support, and we will chat again real soon.